Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event on the hidden force behind wealth inequality in America with our very special guest, Gretchen Morganson. Our program this evening is the first of a fall term series of programs at St. Olaf College on the topic of capitalism, freedom, and community. My name is Edmund Santuri. I'm a professor at St. Olaf College and Morrison Family Director of the College's Institute for Freedom and Community, the institute sponsoring tonight's event and the spring series just mentioned. The purpose of St. Olaf's Institute for Freedom and Community is to stimulate and support free inquiry and meaningful debate of important political and social issues among students, faculty, staff, and the larger public. By exploring diverse ideas about politics, markets, and society, the Institute aims to challenge presuppositions, question easier, comfortable answers, and foster constructive civil dialogue among those with differing values and contending points of view. For help in organizing our event tonight, as always, very special thanks go to Institute staff, Associate Director Eric Grell, Administrative Assistant Linda Carlson, and Student Assistant Jess Horst. Thanks also to Jeff O'Donnell, Joshua Wyatt, and the St. Olaf Broadcast Media Services crew. To Andrea Galswick, Dan Hollering, and Carrie Vanderveen of St. Olaf Marketing and Communications. Thanks to Ash Ashley Hodson, Chair of the St. Olaf Economics Department, for a helpful exchange on our topic tonight. Finally, thanks to St. Olaf College faculty and students who have integrated their study with our event this evening, particularly participants in the Public Affairs Conversation Program, supported by the Institute, and participants in courses of the St. Olaf Economics Department, Environmental Studies, Computer Science, and Film Media Studies programs. To remind our virtual audience members, you are invited to submit a question at any point during the discussion this evening by using the Participate tab on the streaming page. We are honored to have with us tonight as our guest, Gretchen Morganson. Gretchen is the senior financial reporter in the investigations unit at NBC News, a position she has held since December 2019. Previously, she spent two years as investigative reporter for the Wall Street Journal and almost 20 years as an assistant business and financial editor and columnist at the New York Times. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 2002 for her, quote, trenchant and incisive, end of quote, coverage of Wall Street in the New York Times. She's also served on two Pulitzer Prize juries since then. Gretchen is co-author with Joshua Rosner of Reckless Engagement, a New York Times bestseller about the origins of the 2008 financial crisis published by Times Books. She's won two Gerald Ward Loeb Awards, one for her coverage of Wall Street and one for general excellence in financial commentary. Last but certainly not least for us, Gretchen is an alum of St. Olaf College, class of 1976, and currently serves on the college's Board of Regents, as she has for a number of years. There is much more that might be said about Gretchen's distinguished life and career, but for now, Gretchen Morganson, welcome. We're pleased to see you again and to have you with us this evening for this event. Well, thank you so much, Ed, and let's not forget that I have an only son who graduated in 2017. So he was third generation only. And so we have to remember that. Thank you. Very, for, very key connection. Thank you very much for reminding. And he was a student of mine at one point. Uh, Gretchen, uh, before we get to our central topic, I thought some in our audience might be interested in the journey that got you from the point of being a student at St. Olaf College to where you are today. Uh, you were an undergraduate at St. Olaf, where you concentrated on English and history in what was then the Para College, uh, a prototype for St. Olaf's current Center for Integrative Studies, where students create their own course of study. How did you get from there as a student at St. Olaf to becoming a prominent financial journalist for major outlets like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and now NBC News? Well, uh, let's just say that the um, trajectory and uh, was not immediate. The um, acceptance was not immediate by the um, powers that be in New York City media. I knew I wanted to be uh, an investigative reporter, a journalist, and so I uh, left Northfield and hightailed it to New York 
And before I did that, I um, uh, sent out my resume and clips uh, that I had uh, collected and uh, sent them to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Daily News, uh, an array of um, media institutions in the city. And let me just say that the response was a deafening silence. So the only job I could get at that time in anything even sort of remotely like the media business was to be a secretary at Vogue magazine. Now, the good thing about that experience was I should have written the book, The Devil Wears Prada, which was a huge success and became a very successful movie. That was my life when I was at Vogue, but I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't write that book, I should have. So, you know, it was, it was like many paths, I think that people take as they try to find their way in their calling. It was not a direct route. It was a uh, up and down route and circuitous in some ways. Uh, I stayed at Vogue for five years. I was writing their personal finance column by the end of that time. Not that many people read it, but I was writing it. Um, and then I decided to go to Wall Street. And so in 1982, ancient history, I know, I became a stockbroker for a firm called Dean Witter Reynolds in New York City. And I guess I would say the most interesting piece of that puzzle is that when I sat down in my chair to start work as a stockbroker, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was at 780. So we all know that it's had quite a trajectory since then. But anyway, so working as a broker was so important for me to get a grounding in financial um, dealings, in the way the world of finance works, how capital gets raised in this country and around the world. Um, and also in some cases, how the financial world doesn't work well for people. And so that was a tremendous experience for me. It was three years in what I would consider sort of getting a working man's MBA, um, where I really learned the ropes of finance. But it wasn't for me, um, ultimately. And so I went back to writing and got a job at Money Magazine and then really started to come into my own when I got a job at Forbes Magazine, um, which back then was run by a very, very um, exacting and demanding editor and really learned how to do the investigations that I have done subsequently at Forbes. So it, it was a sort of a patchwork of experience, but it really did benefit me in that the brokerage experience gave me a grounding in finance that a lot of financial reporters just don't have. So it's that practical experience of having actually sat, you know, in a brokerage firm and and learned about the different offerings and what happens to prices and analysts reports and to really get into the, the mechanics of how the financial world works was a crucial uh, training ground for me. So that was a little bit different. I left Forbes and then went to the um, New York Times in 1997, uh, where I wrote a weekly column and also news stories. And as you said, spent you know almost 20 years there and then went to the Wall Street Journal and now at NBC. So the period of time at the New York Times was very, very, um, just, uh, there were so many different scandals. It was really almost like a scandal every couple of years. And so covering all of that was, it was really helpful to have the background in Wall Street that I had because I just, I just had a grounding that other financial reporters didn't have. 
so anyway, it, it's it's sort of, I guess, the lesson that I would, you know, take from that experience is not every job is going to be your favorite job. Not every job is going to be perfect for you. Certainly being a secretary at Vogue magazine was nobody's idea of where I wanted to be when I graduated from college. But you use your experience as you can. And, you know, if it's not a good place to work, you learn how not to operate in a, a business environment or an office environment. But anyway, that's that's a little bit of where I uh, came from and how I progressed. That's a, a real interesting story. And I think it will be I th an inspiration to current St. Olaf students who um, uh, will have to find their way um, when they leave St. Olaf uh, in ways that you did. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, Gretchen, again, our topic tonight is the hidden force behind wealth inequality in America. Uh, lots of people have asked me about this. Do, do I need to show up? One person asked me in order to find out what the hidden force is. And uh, so there's a lot of interest in this question. And so let's, could you just answer with two words, uh, what is the hidden force exactly that you're referring to? Well, the hidden force I'm referring to is private equity. That is an industry, it's, a, it's an investment industry and it's a strategy and it has been growing um, really furiously since the 1980s. Um, and so it's, it's an industry that has really taken over um, a huge swath of the American economy and it's having um, a big impact and one of the reasons that I say that it's the secret force is because there's a lot about this industry that is hard to track, that is secretive, that is uh, private, where information is not easily accessible. Um, and even the impact that these companies and these firms are having on the economy is sort of masked and hidden from view because you as a consumer often don't even know that you're interacting with a private equity company. But it's important to understand how a private equity business works because it's the business model that is at the heart of private equity that is central to not only the enormous profits that they have generated for their own practitioners, but also for some of the harm that I believe is really contributing to the wealth gap in the United States. Uh, for those of us who are not as far along in these matters as you and others are, uh, what exactly is a private equity company as opposed to, say, a public company? Okay. Well, private equity is a um, relatively new term for an old strategy, for an old business approach. Back in the 1980s, these firms were called leveraged buyout shops. Leveraged buyouts mean... A company borrows a lot of money from a bank, from creditors, from debt um, you know, investors, and buys another company, then tries to improve its profitability and then sell it, usually within six years. So what these firms do is they take over companies, try to improve them, and then sell them quickly to another buyer. Now, how this differs from other takeovers is that if a, a big corporation buys a, you know, um, a, a unit, uh, an operating business that has sort of a relationship to what it already does, like a railroad might buy, you know, another railroad. Those kinds of takeovers are generally strategic and longer term, i.e. the company that's buying them wants it to enhance its operations for the long haul. Central to the private equity strategy is a relatively quick turnaround. 
a relatively quick sale of the company that you bought and then you know are profiting from. So if you want to sell that company at a profit, you need to, in some cases, many cases, cut costs, particularly if you are carrying a heavy debt load that you amassed to buy out the company. So the problems arise in a private equity takeover when the company being acquired has to cut costs to pay for the interest expense on the debt that's been taken on and to improve the profitability so that the private equity firm can flip the company in five to 10 years. So this is a short term strategy that really is part of the problem. It's the short term aspect of it that is problematic because the companies are not necessarily investing in the operations. They're buying them. They are hoping to slim them down, um, cut costs. Generally speaking, some of the costs that are first to be cut are employee benefits or jobs. And so it's, it's, a, it's a strategy that has at its heart um, a business model that looks for the short-term gain rather than the long-term investment. Does that make sense? Perfect sense. I think it might be useful to look at some cases uh, about which you have written recently in your role as NBC financial investigative reporter. Uh, and can we start with the cases in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa and Minneapolis that involve the so-called environmental remediation companies? some of which are owned uh, in your account by private equity firms. Uh, you say in a recent article that these environmental remediation companies are guilty of what you and others identify as wage theft. And all of this in your account may have something to do with the fact that these environmental remediation companies are owned by private equity firms. Uh, can you help us understand what's going on here? I mean, what are environmental remediation companies? How are they related to wage theft? What is wage theft exactly? And what has all this got to do with private equity companies? And how did all this play out in Cedar Rapids, Iowa and uh, Minneapolis? Well, that's a lot, <laughs> Ed, but I'm happy to do it. Okay, so Private equity, um, let's step back for a moment and say that private equity companies um, are big names in the group uh, in the industry are Blackstone, um, KKR. Um, you also have the Carlisle Group. These are very big and powerful companies, but you also have smaller companies that are jumping into the field. In fact, um, you know, the number of funds that are devoted to this practice uh, over the past decade has more than doubled. So firms in the industry now control $4 trillion in assets. And that is an increase over the past 10 years of 170%. Now, Last year, private equity firms paid $600 billion to acquire companies, up from $250 billion 10 years earlier. So those are just some numbers to have in your mind as you're understanding the growth of this industry. Now, the disaster remediation business is a growing business because of climate change, uh, we just witnessed a, a, we're still witnessing a very busy hurricane season. Um, hurricane Ida was devastating all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Northeast. Um, and firms, there are many firms in the uh, business of remediating, repairing, um, you know, businesses, hotels, homes, you know, that are damaged by floods, by uh, hurricanes, uh, whatever it is. Or you also have situations 
Square, which happened in Minneapolis, where you had the George Floyd protests and buildings were damaged in that circumstance. So these remediation companies come in and they repair the damaged buildings. Now, this has been an attractive business, uh, increasingly um, attractive to private equity companies because of the billions and billions of dollars that is at stake in these kinds of cleanups. Some of it is government money. A lot of it is government money. Also private insurance. But there's a tremendous amount of money put towards repairing these situations. So private equity has gotten involved uh, in the disaster remediation business. And what that, how it worked in Cedar Rapids was, this was after last August, August 2020, when there was a huge, I think they call it a rechecho, it's a, a huge storm that just devastated the state. And in Cedar Rapids, a um, it was a nursing home had been damaged. And this firm came in and hired labor brokers to bring their own people to um, remediate, to clean up, to put up, install drywall, whatever needed to be done. And wage theft occurs when a company does not pay its workers what they're owed, um, makes them work off the clock, uh, doesn't give them a lunch hour. These kinds of things all qualify as wage theft. And it is a crime. It is a crime and it is a problem, but it is a hidden problem because many workers do not want to raise their hand and say, I am a victim of this. So in the disaster remediation business, what you have are labor brokers who hire other people to come and do the work. But the companies, in this particular case, the company was a name Blue Sky, and it was from Centennial, Colorado, and they do a lot of this work. They're owned by uh, two uh, major private equity firms. And what happened was the labor broker claimed that they weren't paying him. And so he could not pay the men. And the men were basically not being paid, had no money to eat, had no place to live, um, had to actually be welcomed by a local pastor in Cedar Rapids to live in the church. Um, and basically it became a problem because the company wasn't paying, according to the labor broker. Now, when I interviewed Blue Skies um, communications folks, they said, no, that's not the right story. The labor broker is the problem. And so this is a dispute and th there are disputed facts, they say. But the point is, um, this is what happens. They ultimately paid the workers what they were owed. And, but it took a lot of work. It took actually local media to be covering this. It took um, the protests of some local, uh, like the, the uh, minister that was helping them. So it really was a high profile case in Cedar Rapids. And so uh, the company ultimately did pay the men um, for the work that they had done. So that was an unusual outcome. So this is a case in which you might have a situation where a private equity firm goes in and says, I wonder if we could have, if we could lower our costs and therefore increase our profits. So that is the question here. And so what experts told me in the situation in Cedar Rapids was, that this is a business strategy. It is a situation where um, people who are vulnerable, perhaps undocumented, um, you know, are told to work, are given a, a certain amount of money, and then possibly 
not actually paid what they said they would um, be paid. Uh, this company is also under scrutiny in by the city of Minneapolis, who is looking into allegations of wage theft. And so it is a, a problem for very low income workers. And so that's sort of at the heart of the, what I consider to be the wealth gap that we're talking about here. On the one hand, you have very wealthy firms, private equity firms, and very wealthy uh, executives who are benefiting from a strategy that keeps lower income workers really uh, at a disadvantage. And so to me, that's a point of which you are expanding the, way, the wealth gap in this country. But there are many other examples and that I think are worth talking about. So uh, uh, just one question on this. Uh, 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 as I was reading your account of this, uh, it did seem like there were three different players in this story. Um, um, and so you had the private equity company and then you had the remediation company. But then you had these subcontractors uh, who were involved. And, you know, a question, a natural question that uh, that arises, I think, when you're reading an account like this is, you know, who who exactly is the bad person, uh, the bad agent in this? Um, your story does suggest that it's pretty clear in your view that it's the re remediation company and then the private equity company is behind this, somehow stimulating uh, the kind of cost cutting uh, ventures that are illegal, as a matter of fact, rather than the subcontract. I'm wondering, could you speak to that issue a little bit? Because I can imagine someone saying, well, how do you know the subcontractor isn't just paying the people rather than the, re the remediation company? Well, in fact, that's a, a great question, Ed, because the subcontractor relationship in this kind of a circumstance really is um, a, a situation where it gives the corporation that's hiring the subcontractor, <clears throat> excuse me, plausible deniability for any kind of bad activity that occurs, okay? So even though these gentlemen who were working in this, um, uh, you know, retirement home were wearing blue sky t-shirts when they were doing the work, blue sky said that they were not their employees. They were actually the employees of the labor broker. And so what the economist that I spoke with about wage theft told me was that this kind of uh, once removed relationship with these remediation companies allows for a plausible deniability of problems. And there have been other cases of that kind of a thing. And so, you know, if, if it were Blue Sky hiring these workers and Blue Sky had to worry about being, you know, um, the dutiful employer and crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's, it might behave differently than if it has this intermediary that it can, um, you know, pay, but also that it can look to and say, well, gee, that wasn't our fault. It was the intermediary's fault. Now, as far as the private equity firm directing this, I don't think that's occurring. I think the private equity firms buy the companies that they believe have the potential to generate terrific profits for them. That is the goal. That's what they look for. That's the analysis that they make. It's really all about profits for them. And so it's not that they are directing these companies, but the incentives are there. The, uh, the, the you know, it's basically the business model. We're going to be highly profitable. We're going to increase the profitability of the companies that we buy, and then we're going to sell them. So it's, again, it's sort of these different 
they're they're linked these entities but they're not sort of directing as a corporation would if the corporation had different units that were operating in this way it's that plausible deniability um, element that i think is important that's interesting uh, you say there are other cases, and so could we shift now to another example? And could you say something about the uh, what I found to be, at any rate, intriguing circumstances surrounding the so-called mining of bitcoins on Seneca Lake in upstate New York, uh, a mining that some think, surprisingly enough, may be creating environmental damage to the lake? Uh, Bitcoins, of course, are a form of digital currency. They just exist in cyberspace, so they're not mined literally uh, by unearthing them. Uh, mining is a metaphor in this case and has something to do with earning Bitcoin by tracking electronically uh, Bitcoin transactions. Anyway, how might the mining of Bitcoins be causing environmental damage to Seneca Lake? And what has this got to do with the hidden force of private equity companies. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if you know, but Bitcoin mining is very um, energy uh, intensive. Okay. Um, Cambridge University has a wonderful website in which they um, sort of tr track or map how uh, much electricity Bitcoin mining takes up or uses. And, you know, it's like equal to entire countries, okay? So here we have Bitcoin mining that is using enough electricity to light an entire nation, all right? And so right there, you have an issue with a company. Uh, if, if you're a miner of Bitcoin, you are you have an enormous environmental carbon footprint, okay? Not all cryptocurrencies are like this. It is really pretty much Bitcoin that has the big carbon footprint. But in any case, so this situation arose because private equity firms have been buying uh, mothballed power plants power plants that have gone offline, no longer operating. They've bought them and they are using those plants as a locale and for the energy to do the Bitcoin mining. And so on the shores of Seneca Lake in a small town in upstate New York, a plant had been fallow was an old uh, coal burning plant. And it was purchased by a private equity firm and it was retrofitted into a gas fired plant and it now mines Bitcoin. And so this was a company called Greenwich Generation and it got sort of in Dutch with the residents nearby because they were concerned about the impact of the company's operations on the temperature of the water in the lake in, and in an outlet to the lake um, where the water from the power plant goes, but also um, from the carbon emissions. And those were pretty significant. So here was a situation where you had a private equity firm buying up an old power plant, mothballed power plant, starting it up again. And for the purpose not of producing necessarily electricity for the area or for residents, but more for the um, creation, for the mining of Bitcoin. Now, the company does do some power generation um, for the grid, but it's uh, the investments, the investors are very excited about the company because of the Bitcoin mining. So anyway, it became a dispute between locals who were concerned about the carbon emissions 
and about the hot water um, that the company was putting into this outlet that went into the lake. And uh, so it was a, a really fascinating story of how a company would take over an old um, power plant, completely refashion it into this very you know hot commodity um, that really only benefits a small, small number of people and possibly, you know, um, hurts or harms or at least enrages <laughs> and angers the local community. So again, this is a situation where, you know, uh, the private equity firm is more concerned about the profits. And believe me, the profits in this Bitcoin mining for the company have been substantial. Um, and but at what cost? And so that's always the question that I ask as a financial reporter, which is, OK, the profits are very, very compelling. The story is very compelling. But at what cost? And so what I believe we need to start to talk about and think about are the other stakeholders who are involved in the companies taken over by private equity, like the workers, like the pensioners, um, it, like the uh, investors, who by the way are not necessarily earning the high returns anymore that private equity used to be characterized by. Where are the high, um, where are the high returns going? The higher returns are going to the stock market. I mean, really, so private equity had very, very powerful returns all the way really up until 2010, maybe. But over the last decade, the, um, the, the excess returns that private equity had been generating sort of over other benchmarks has really dissipated. The stock market is now, it's really pretty much a match. And what's interesting about that, Ed, is that if you go buy an index fund, you pay maybe, you know, 10 basis points or, you know, a fraction of a percent. But buying a private equity investment is extremely expensive, very high cost, very low transparency, hard to get out of very illiquid and very risky. And so when you put that against the stock market, uh, it's a very interesting change of events that private equities returns are diminishing compared to the stock market. That's very interesting. Um, another thing you've written about recently is the way private equity companies have impacted healthcare, hospitals, physician practices, nursing homes. Uh, among other things, you write about the case of the emergency room physician Ming Lin, employed by a medical center in Washington state. Um, what exactly happened there? And more generally, how have private equity companies affected the quality of medical care in your account? Well, health care has been a huge focus of private equity companies. Um, really, it's it's been for over a decade, um, a major, major focus for them. Um, I think the numbers are $500 billion um, in uh, investments in healthcare just over the past decade. I'm looking for my data here. But anyway, it's, it's an enormous interest. Um, we're talking about nursing homes. We are talking about um, healthcare management companies, we're talking about physician practices, dental practices, um, and we are talking about the management of emergency departments in hospitals across the country. Um, so two major private equity firms own, uh, run almost half of the private, of half of the emergency departments across the country. Now, what that has translated to in 
certain people's opinions, among them being this physician, Ming Lin, that you mentioned, is that hospitals are no longer as concerned about treating the patient. They're more concerned about the bottom line. And so this story of this doctor in Bellingham, Washington, is fascinating because he had been at this hospital for 17 years in the emergency department. And he was fired in March of 2020 after he complained publicly about a lack of um, protective gear for the workers in the emergency department. Um, and so his concern was that they were not investing in the uh, necessary uh, equipment, uh, protective wear, gloves, gowns, all of that. Um, they had not invested enough in that and they were not prepared. And he went out and made this public statement about it and was fired. And what's interesting about that is it sort of indicates the, uh, the, the notion that in these kinds of operations, they just do not accept people who try to speak truth to power. So Dr. Lin was fired. Um, he now, by the way, works for the Indian Health Service. He is truly an amazing physician, um, still working. And I think he's happier where he is now. But he and some other um, colleagues have formed a group and they're trying to uh, let people know about the problems that private equity ownership of healthcare properties um, mean. And so this was a circumstance where there wasn't an investment in the kinds of protective gear that was needed for the people in the hospital. He spoke up, then he was fired. Um, other healthcare uh, entities, uh, nursing homes are a very, very um, uh, troubling um, uh, investment by um, private equity firms. They have been very, very big investors in nursing homes. In fact, there was um, earlier this year, a very comprehensive study was published by the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, and it was by academics from New York University, the University of Chicago, um, and one other. But what they found was that private equity owned nursing homes had substantially higher resident deaths. So among homes that were owned by private equity firms, 10% more of the residents died each year than in non-private equity owned nursing homes. Now, the academics that did this study said that the reason for this appeared to be declines in nursing staff, and reduced compliance with standards of care. So again, this was a very established um, study, very disturbing. They concluded that over a period of 13 years, I believe, an additional 20,150 lives were lost because of the private equity ownership of nursing homes. So this is a study that has not been disputed. Um, it is very rigorous. You can find it on the uh, NBER website. And it is an example of the kinds of things I was talking about earlier, that it's about profits and it that is the crucial um, uh, drive for these firms and patient care comes second. And when you have this kind of a, a report or this kind of a study about nursing homes, 
I think it is very, very uh, telling and very revealing. There was another study in New Jersey that found that nursing homes run by private equity owners experienced higher COVID infections, um, an infection rate almost 25% higher than the statewide nursing home average and 57% higher than at public facilities. So it's, it's an issue where I think the way to frame it, Ed, would be healthcare is a, an area where it, you really have to be concerned with patient outcomes ahead of profits. And so the private equity takeovers of healthcare have really caused, I think, people to question whether that is wise and whether it should be continuing. One of your uh, essays on, um, on uh, private equity and healthcare, you say, in the new situation, the fid fiduciary duty to the share is to the shareholders rather than to the patients. Uh, and that was an arresting remark for me reading it because medical ethicists have talked for years about the physician's covenant with the patient. Uh, and in your account, this seems to be, this is being undercut in various ways by profit motivation and, and practice. But I'm wondering, you know, just, if I could just play devil's advocate for the moment, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the problem of medical costs in our society. And I can imagine someone defending the, the uh, private equity approach to these matters is, you know, you've got to figure out ways to, to bring down costs. Otherwise, it's just, it's, think these things are just going to be priced out entirely from, for everybody. Um, I mean, what do you say about that, that there is something, is there anything that private equity does in the way of a good in terms of making things more efficient, bringing down costs, consolidating, economy of scale? I mean, I don't know how you would characterize it in particular, but is there anything at all to that argument that um, the market does something for medical care in, to, the, to the degree that it brings costs down? <laughs> Well, I think that certainly I would say that private equity firms do bring uh, a streamlined approach to the companies that they buy. And when you're talking about a uh, widget manufacturer, when you're talking about the production of a good that you know will be competitive, will be more competitive and therefore more profitable, I am for that. And by the way, I am a big proponent of our capitalist system. I am not a socialist, I am a capitalist. But these kinds of practices are what some people say characterize as capitalism on steroids. And we need to have capitalism that has checks and balances. And we just haven't had that in this arena. Now, the question of healthcare is obviously huge. Now, the reason that these firms are invested in healthcare is because it's like, what, 18% of GDP? I mean, it's enormous. It's a huge pie. And also, there are tremendous profits in it because of government payments, Medicare payments, enormous. And so the, the classic, you know, case is to go into an industry where there are a lot of government payments because the government isn't the best consumer, doesn't know how, you know, they're not the best shopper for comparison shopping. But, okay, so I just feel that the healthcare industry is not an area where the focus should be on profits. Yes, healthcare costs are out of control and they're in this country higher than almost anywhere else in the world, if not absolutely anywhere else in the world. Drug prices out of sight, out of control. But these firms are not helping bring those costs down. In fact, some of the firms that own, that run the companies that manage the emergency departments have been responsible for what have been called these uh, surprise medical bills. 
So what happens is you go to a hospital, you think that it's in your network for your insurance coverage, but then you find out that the emergency department, because it's run by another entity, not the hospital, they bill out of your network and you get a surprise medical bill. So if you look at the companies that were behind the surprise medical billing, they were private equity firms. Okay, thank you, uh, Gretchen. I think now might be a good time to go to uh, one or two uh, questions that have come to us. Uh, one online now, the first video question. Hello, Mrs. Morganson. My name is Josh Nierengarten, and I'm a senior here at St. Olaf. My question for you deals with the rising role of private equity firms in industries like healthcare and construction, and their reliance on the use of subcontractors. As you have written, these contractors are not considered typical employees, which provides their employer a layer of protection regarding legal liability for abuse is like wage theft. This is a, is a severe erosion of worker rights and will assuredly lead to even greater wealth inequality. With this in mind, I ask what can we, what can be done to maintain the integrity and dignity of the average American laborer given the rise of subcontractor use? Well, that's a great question, Josh. And one of the surprising facts that I learned when I was reporting on this story was how few investigators there are on the federal level um, dedicated to investigating the issue of wage theft. And so the first thing that I would say that we should do is to increase the number of investigators uh, that the Department of Labor employs to pursue these kinds of cases. Um, when I was reporting the story, um, the San Diego District Attorney started a new program in which she is going to be prosecuting um, cases of wage theft. The city of Minneapolis uh, and actually Minnesota is very proactive on wage theft. The Attorney General has a deep concern about it. So I think that we do have to have greater numbers of um, investigators and on a federal level, but also on a state level who are dedicated to stamping out these practices. And as you say, um, you know, protecting the integrity of the American worker and particularly the most vulnerable American workers. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, now, this is a question that comes from the course, the Introduction, Introduction to Environmental Studies. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Brentrup is the uh, professor of the course. Do you see the accessibility that cryptocurrency provides to the public as a positive change to the wealth gap in America? Will that change in the wealth gap negatively affect the environment? Well, as I said earlier, it's Bitcoin is really the major um, environmental problem in the crypto world. Uh, the others are not as problematic. Um, so, you know, it, it's not going to happen. But if Bitcoin were to change the you know rules around mining to something that does not require this Im immense amount of power and electricity, then it would be different. Um, but that said, you know, I am always very keen to uh, welcome democratization, I guess I would say, of finance. You know, that anything that opens the door for uh, everyday people to have access to financial um, instruments that can help them prosper, that can help them save money that can help them uh, save for retirement. I am always for that. And the stock market, you know, over the course of my career has been hugely democratized. Um, the, you know, very, the popular Robinhood app, for instance, is a big uh, democratization tool for the stock market. I always am 
alert and fearful of claims of democratization and claims of allowing the everyday you know, investor to come into a new strategy or a new instrument because oftentimes they are victimized because they are considered um, unsophisticated. They are not necessarily knowledgeable. They don't know the right questions to ask. And so they'll maybe get in when they see the price of a cryptocurrency skyrocketing, and that would be maybe the worst time to invest. So I love the idea of democratization of finance, but it is so, the, the, the deck is so stacked against the average investor that I am always very wary of claims that a new strategy, a new instrument is going to be the best thing for an individual investor. Thank you, Gretchen. I think we'll go to the next video question. <clears throat> Hi, this is Charlotte Thompson, class of 2024, asking a question on behalf of PatCon 280A. Regarding the recent increase in private equity firms owning medical and healthcare practices, what do you think sparked this dramatic transition from mostly physician-owned practices to mostly private equity-owned practices? And what do you, in your professional opinion, believe this change means for our healthcare industry in the future? Thank you. Another great question. Um, yes, so this has been a, a pattern in practice, um, private equity firms taking over physician practices. And um, the reason that they're able to do it is often the physicians are looking to sell they're maybe at retirement age. And so the firms can put together groups of practices and bring a sort of streamlined approach to them. Um, again, the problem associated with this, according to the sources I've spoken to, including Dr. Lin, again, the emergency room doctor, is that the firms, once they're taken over, the, the practices, the, the physician practices, once they're taken over, again, the focus is not so much on patient outcome and patient care. Again, it's more uh, focused on the, the, the customers on the assembly line. Um, uh, you know, inserting nurses instead of doctors to see patients, uh, anything to reduce the costs associated with um, a, a patient uh, visit or patient care. And so the problem becomes, does that really serve the customer? Or is it once again, a situation where it may be serving the private equity firm, and it may be serving that firm's investors primarily over patients. Um, again, this is what I've learned and this is what I've been told from people who have lived through this. It's very interesting that it's occurring as often as it is because there have been laws on the books um, across America, state laws, against what's called the corporate practice of medicine. And for this very reason, that um, it, people were concerned that you were gonna have situations where if profits were the key issue and the key uh, driver, that you would have a situation where the medical care would decline. Now, there have been a few cases brought against uh, private equity owners of physician practices, but very few and there could be far, far more. For some reason, state AGs are not bringing cases against the corporate practice of medicine. And so they have allowed these kinds of um, roll-ups of physician practices to occur, particularly in dental care, for instance, um, very big. Uh, dermatology is another one. Um, it's really in places where there are some pretty good profit margins that you've been seeing these practices. But again, the regulators have really not been doing their jobs to ensure that 
this balance between profits and patient care doesn't get out of whack. Thank you, Gretchen. This is another question from uh, Professor Brentrup's Intro to Environmental Studies. Uh, as someone whose career has largely been in business financial journalism, how do you balance the exploitation inherent in our capitalist system with your own sense of right and wrong? Do you find it hard to report on these events? Um, I don't find it hard to report on the events because what I do in my job as often as possible is to hold powerful institutions to account. Now, I'm one person. I can only do what one person can do. I am very fortunate to have had very formidable institutions behind me, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, NBC. And so when I am able to write, when I write about institutions that may be doing the wrong thing, I have backing, unlike many other um, journalists. So I feel that my role as a business reporter and an investigative reporter is to call these people out when they are doing the wrong thing. I have done that for decades. Um, and it varies from sort of uh, decade to decade. So during the mortgage crisis, I wrote, and the years leading up to it, I wrote a tremendous amount of stories about big banks that were doing uh, borrowers wrong and that had been very aggressive in making loans that they knew the borrowers could never repay. Um, so that was an entire block of time devoted to educating people about what went on there and trying to hold these people to account. Uh, it, it varies from, as I said, sort of period to period. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, I was writing a lot about uh, accounting fraud. Um, WorldCom, Tyco, Enron, all of those sort of famous flameouts, corporate uh, accounting um, problems. So those, that was another situation where um, really basically trying to educate people about what was going on. So my answer to that is my role as a business journalist is to explain what's happening so the everyday person can understand it, to call bad actors uh, to account, and to um, basically try to ensure that capitalism isn't wrecked by capitalists. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, next video question. It is a widely known issue that the standard of living across the United States has drastically increased. However, the minimum wage has not. This makes me wonder how we can improve minimum wage so people who are getting paid minimum wage won't have to work multiple jobs just so their families can afford basic housing. This also makes me wonder, is there a way to achieve equity by bridging the divide between the lower, middle, and upper class? And how can we fix that invisible epidemic of people who are not getting paid adequately just because of their immigration status? Wow, that's a lot, but very important questions. All right, so very, very important to understand that during the most recent couple of decades, um, even going back into the 90s, that wages have been stagnant. Labor basically has been under the control of capital. Capital has been going like this. Labor has been doing this. And that is the force behind the growing wealth gap in this country. 
Now, one of the reasons why I think that labor has been under control and wages have been so stagnant is because we've had these companies who have taken over enterprises and have been able to streamline and fire a lot of people. Um, retailing is a huge example. And private equity has been extremely important in retailing. And they have done severe damage to some major old line retailing names, Sears, Roebuck, um, uh, Toys R Us, uh, the, the list goes on and on of the companies that were purchased by private equity retailers, purchased by private equity, and then went bankrupt. Um, the losses to the workers in those situations are extremely, they're horrifying. I know of a case in point, a furniture retailer in Michigan called Art Van was a pr privately owned company, family owned for many, many years, was purchased by Tom Lee and Partners, which is a private equity firm in Boston. They purchased uh, Art Van Furniture in 2017. Um, they immediately piled on $400 million in debt on the company. Uh, the real estate under the stores was sold. So the stores then now had to pay rent, um, which was an increased cost. The company started to um, decline. Uh, some of the managers that were brought in by the private equity firm didn't know anything about furniture retailing, according to the people I spoke to who were employees there. Um, you had a, the, the company was uh, really obviously going down. Now, COVID obviously put the last nail in the coffin. The company filed for bankruptcy in, um, I believe, March or April of last year. But it had been declining because of the heavy debt load and because of the, um, the management uh, failings of the new private equity executives. Interestingly, sadly, this was a circumstance in which when the bankruptcy occurred, the employees lost everything. They lost their jobs. They lost their health benefits. They even lost their own personal money that they had put into flexible savings accounts that the company had sponsored. The, this was money of their own that they had put into these savings accounts offered by the company. When the company went bankrupt, these employees lost even their own money. So here was a circumstance where the workers were really taking the brunt of the failure. Now, after a public outcry, Tom Lee, the private equity firm that had bought Art Van, decided to start an employee fund. And they put aside $2 million for the workers, and each worker got $1,200. The point is these failures devastate people's lives. There were people that I spoke with who worked for Art Van for 25 years. They loved the company. It was a company that was like a family. Um, they, the CEO knew everyone by name. And then a private equity company comes in and buys it. And three years later, it's bankrupt. So these are the stories that I hear from people about the impact of private equity. And that's a retailing business. They are also huge in fast food. Uh, one of the biggest private equity firms that you probably haven't heard of is Rourke Capital, which owns um, Dunkin' Donuts, Arby's, um, 
uh, Sonic, uh, all kinds of fast food um, uh, operations. And the company was also very instrumental in lobbying against the $15 an hour minimum wage legislation that would have enabled their workers to make more money. So these are the battles that are going on in these companies. And it's just something that I really feel that we need to shed a light on. Thank you, Gretchen. Here's a question from Barry, class of 2022, St. Olaf College. What would good regulation look like for the private equity firms? The kind that won't erode the bottom line for private equity firms and growth, as well as preserving non-shareholder stakeholders' interests. Well, I think one very good quick fix that would address this entire issue of the wealth gap would be if the if legislation were written to eliminate the immensely profitable tax break that private equity executives receive they pay only 20% on earnings that they make because they are considered like long-term gains. They're considered investment rather than uh, wages. This is called the carried interest loophole. And it is a travesty and it really needs to be eliminated. There is currently legislation now but there has been legislation trying to eliminate this loophole for years and it never gets anywhere because the private equity firms have lobbying armies and lobbying millions. And so they lobby to make sure that this tax break, which essentially means that a private equity Titan pays a lower tax rate than a secretary, than a bus driver, than a you name it. Um, it is ridiculous. It needs to be eliminated and it hasn't been. That would be an easy fix right there because that is very unfair. As far as regulation, you know, the SEC is always, Securities and Exchange Commission is always outgunned. Uh, they're always, um, you know, outmanned. They, they, they don't have the, uh, the money, the uh, power that many of these firms have. But we do have a new, SEC chairman, uh, Gary Gensler, who does seem to be making some noises about trying to be more aggressive. Um, you know, it's it certainly is an area that I believe is ripe for more scrutiny. Um, I don't think that it's um, something that we need to worry about the profitability of these firms. I mean, they are immensely profitable and you can just look at their stock prices and that'll tell you just in the last year, um, these ex executives running these firms have seen their stock holdings, their net worths rise by billions of dollars, billions of dollars. So, Leon Black, who used to, who co-founded and used to be the head of Apollo Global Management, um, his net worth, according to Forbes, is now around ten billion dollars, and last year it was about eight point seven. So, when you have during the course of one year, um, people 
increasing their wealth by billions of dollars, it, it really makes you wonder what's happening. And at the same time, people at the lower end of the spectrum, you know, are having difficulty putting food on the table. Thank you, Gretchen. Here's a question from Ashley Hodson, who is the uh, chair of the economics department. Can you explain the GameStop situation from early 2021 and how it relates to the private equity problems you report on? Well, GameStop is not really a private equity situation. Um, GameStop and Robinhood and uh, it, it, it's a, it's very complicated. Here's how I would summarize it. Um, Robin Hood is an app that young people and novice investors like to use on their phone to invest in stocks and bonds and options and all of these things, mostly stocks and options. And, but there is, and it's free. Robinhood says the trading is free. Um, you don't have to pay a commission to buy an option to buy a stock on, on the Robinhood app. But it isn't free because there is something behind the scenes that you don't know about called payment for order flow. And what that means is that Robinhood gets paid by big Wall Street trading firms to send all of its orders, its customers' orders, to particular trading houses who pay Robinhood for the privilege of executing those trades. And when those firms execute those trades, it's unclear that the Robinhood customer gets the best price. So it's a, it's, it's a kind of a complicated Wall Street plumbing behind the scenes story, <clears throat> but you can synthesize it to say that if you think it's free, then you're probably uh, getting taken for a ride. And certainly there is no such thing as free on Wall Street. So what you think of as a free trade, you're paying, you just don't see the amount you're paying because it's going on over here um, behind the scenes in a trading floor, trading house, trading operation that you can't see. I don't know if that answers the question, but um, it's a very, very interesting situation because it is hidden from view. Thank you, Gretchen. This question from uh, Gabriel Contreras, who is a sophomore at St. Olaf. Crypto coins or cryptocurrency mining in the international picture has become a big source of income for people in countries with economic distress. Uh, I think what's meant here is, is, the crypto, is it the crypto mining that is bad for the environment? How do we approach this question of balancing economic development versus environmental sustainability or vice versa, using the United States example? Well, again, uh, the Bitcoin example is really the um, the environmental problem among the cryptocurrencies. The others do not carry the same um, environmental weight and carbon footprint that Bitcoin does. So that could be solved. Cryptocurrencies do not have to use the um, amounts of energy that Bitcoin does, but Bitcoin was sort of the first and it's the most popular and it's what people think of when they think of cryptocurrencies. So, um, you know, it is it is the sort of uh, main, main crypto. Um, I think that focusing on the environmental impact of Bitcoin mining is um, uh, increasing. I mean, I think more and more people are aware of the uh, heavy environmental cost associated with this um, kind of a practice. And so there is an awareness that it is a problem. And that's, of course, the first step to making sure that 
something gets done about it. Um, I don't know what that might be, but certainly awareness is important and the world is becoming very aware of the issues around um, the environmental problems associated with Bitcoin mining. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, moving in a, a slightly different direction, um, uh, you mentioned to me just yesterday um, that you haven't written yet, uh, but you intend to write uh, on what you see as a problem of diversity within private equity companies. So um, now is to give us a foretaste of uh, what you will be writing on this topic or what some of the issues are here. Yeah, so, you know, this is interesting, right? The world is very focused on diversity right now. And many American corporations have made pledges to um, bring new uh, thrust and drive to bring diversity to their staffs. Um, uh, private equity is very much a white man's world. And I think that the field and the, the industry understands that that is a problem. Here are some data points from some uh, recent research. So BCG is a consulting firm. Um, they did a report and they found that private equity firms have fewer programs in place to promote diversity in their ranks. The proportion of workers at private equity owned firms who said that they had witnessed discrimination, the report found, was 13 percentage points higher than at public companies. At the same time, the report found that fewer employees at private equity-owned firms felt comfortable reporting the incidents. So that, I think, is a really interesting data point. Um, these firms have a lot of work to do. Now, gender diversity is also a problem. In March 2021, a um, well-established and respected data provider in the field, Prequin, found that females made up only 20% of private equity employees and just 12% of those firms' senior roles were held by women. So, I mean, just on this particular uh, issue, I think that private equity has some explaining to do. Do you have any intuitions, Gretchen, as to why there's a special problem here in the private equity world? It feels almost to me like the private equity world now is where Wall Street was maybe 30, 40 years ago. Um, you know, it's very cliquish. It's very sort of insular. Um, it, these are people that were on Wall Street and then went to start these firms. Um, it, it feels like it's a kind of a, a a Wall Street iteration where Wall Street has basically tried to do much better job at, at diversity than these firms have been doing. I don't know why. I think that they understand that they're now under the radar and so that they have to start working on this. <clears throat> but it just feels to me like they are, it's a throwback almost to the way Wall Street was operating back when I was um, I was there, which is, you know, ancient history. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, next video question. Hello, ma'am. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for your time. It is an honor to ask you a question. So a lot of your life's work has been centered around reporting. However, in 1981, you took on the role of a stockbroker at Dean Wheater. How did that come about? And what does that say about higher education, right? Your experiences as a reporter, how did that prepare you to be a stockbroker? Pretty much, how does a reporter 
broker stocks. Thank you. I love that question. Um, so at the time when I became a stockbroker, <clears throat> I was not making a living wage at Vogue magazine, and I didn't have a wealthy father, and I wasn't married at the time, didn't have a wealthy boyfriend. So I was taking care of myself and I was paying my own bills. But I was making very little because at Vogue, you were privileged to have the job and it wasn't really about um, getting paid. So I wanted to try to find work that I could do where I might make a decent living for myself. And I had been writing personal finance columns for Vogue. And so I thought, well, maybe I can help investors to do the right thing with their money. Maybe I can use my ability to explain how things work in finance to help the average investor figure out what he or she should buy and or sell. So that was really the motivation and it was to try to make a better um, living for myself, living in the city of New York, which is can be expensive. Um, what I ended up learning about was so fascinating and I, I, so educational for me and so important with my basis as a writer that it looks in sort of hindsight like I knew what I was doing and that this was basically just an educational stop along the way for me, learning, you know, in the trenches of Wall Street how finance works. It really wasn't, that wasn't the way I had approached it going in, but that's sort of what ended up happening. Um, I felt that I was not happy as a broker because I was at the mercy of the stock market and my clients more important, we're at the mercy of the stock market. And I felt badly when things went wrong and when they lost money. So I had too big of a capacity for guilt involving that sort of thing to be a successful stockbroker. But I learned so much and it was so important um, that I continued to be able to educate myself that that's really why I went into the field. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, uh, we've got a f just a few more minutes, and I'm wondering if we couldn't just uh, step back and pose a kind of big philosophical question of sorts, um, and that is your attitude toward capitalism. And earlier you were saying that you know you are a capitalist and you're not a socialist, and you just think we need to make some adjustments and so forth. Um, but, you know, some years ago, you edited a volume entitled The Capitalist Bible. Now, the, the title is perhaps a bit misleading because the book is actually a primer on what capitalism is, its history, its important figures, its central concepts, and so forth. But I think, you know, there is in that book, published in 2008, I think in moments, at any, way, at any rate, a kind of celebratory tone, a kind of, a kind of affirmation of capitalism. Capitalism is this remarkable engine for human good. I mean, I, I'm wondering, have you changed your mind about this? And in part, what, what prompts my question is some of the things you've been writing most recently about private equity companies, but also um, an exchange we had in the middle of the summer. You were looking over at the St. Olaf uh, Institute for Freedom and Community Program, and you came across the concept of mor the, the term moral capitalism. Uh, which is a term that one of our uh, subsequent guests uh, is going to talk, is going to use. And you said you were interested in that event. You want to see what you want, you want, you want us to see why moral capitalism is not an oxymoron, as you put it. Uh, and that suggests to me that maybe you, there has been kind of a change in your attitude since 2008. Is that, is that fair or am I overreading? Well, I think you're right. And I think you're um, you're 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 onto something uh, very perspicacious. But I guess what I would say is um, the 2008 financial crisis was a real eye opener for me. Um, the idea that banks would make mortgages, sell mortgages that they knew were going to fail. Um, uh, lure borrowers into loans that they knew they couldn't repay, 
Um, and uh, this was just completely new to me. I really was shocked by the level of um, uh, mischief would be a word, um, but the the practices that really brought the nation's economy to its knees. Um, that was a defining moment for me, not only because I was reporting on a daily basis about the impacts of these loans on human beings, actual people whose uh, furniture was thrown out on the curb when they were uh, when they lost their home because they couldn't pay their mortgage, um, uh, watching the uh, you know collapse of the economy of the, the near collapse of the banking system. That was all extremely, extremely troubling to me. And so, yes, I would say that the trajectory of time that uh, you know my career has spanned, I would say that what I see is capitalism is going more towards uh, what uh, one might call the sort of unchecked capitalism. And maybe I'll leave with this comment from uh, Stanley Sporkin, who is a, was uh, no longer living, the first uh, director of enforcement at the Securities and Exchange Commission, a brilliant prosecutor and tough as nails and exactly the kind of person you would want to head enforcement at the SEC. What he said was this, Capitalism is the greatest thing going, but unchecked, it's its own undoing. I think he said that pretty well. And what I'm interested in doing is shining a light on the unchecked capitalism that really has the potential to do major harm in this country. Thank you, uh, Gretchen, for that honest summation. Uh, we've come now to the end of our time. Uh, thanks to the audience for joining us tonight in this stimulating exchange with Gretchen Morganson, senior financial reporter in the investigations unit at NBC News. Uh, and thanks so much to you, Gretchen, for being with us and for sharing with us your views on the secret force behind wealth inequality in America. Thanks, Ed. This fall term, St. Olaf College's Institute for Freedom and Community continues its series of public events on the theme, Capitalism, Freedom, and Community. The next event in this series is on markets and morality with George Mason economist Virgil Storr, co-author of the book, Do Markets Corrupt Our Morals? That event will be on Tuesday, September 21st at 7 p.m. Central Time. Learn more about these and other events at institute.stoloff.edu. That's institute.stolaf.edu. We hope you can join us for these events. But for now, good night, be safe, and be well.